Así que lo vamos a grabar para que todos tengan acceso más tarde. Luego siempre ponemos nuestros materiales en nuestra página de internet, eh, donde de hecho si no la han visitado, tenemos muchos recursos y muchos materiales de workshops previos. Y también nada más les quiero decir que yo me voy a tener que salir en un ratito, pero eh, mi colega Emily Bernate, que también está, es parte de Tex, ella se va a encargar eh, de hacer todo lo que, lo que falte. Y con eso yo creo que ya es todo. Podemos darle la palabra a María y Molly y pueden compartir su pantalla y empezar y, y decir ustedes cómo quieren que sea la estructura del, del webinar. Gracias. Ok. Here's our information and we'll show this again at the end if you want to ever contact us and ask us more questions. But I just wanted to start with that. And we asked a few of you this, but so, several of you have already come in. Um, we'd love to know where you teach. Um, so the way you enter this is there's the, you just go to, you can use your, your you can either use your, your computer or I, I oftentimes use my phone um, so that you can have two, two devices going at once. Uh, menti.com and that's the code. This is actually one of uh, Maria and uh, one of the tools that Maria and I both enjoy using because it allows a lot of interactivity in the classroom. And it allows people to be anonymous, which sometimes helps encourage participation. And somebody also asked that answered in the chat too. Darn, that was me. I was trying to say St. Edwards and I put yeah. Edwards. Just no, no, wor no worries. <laughs> see Austin. Let's see. Christian said he works at Bowdoin. Marco's at UCLA. I don't know if Diana and Isabel are here with us or they're just getting the Texas Christian, UCLA. I'm not sure I know what ST is. Is that the saint? Is that going with this? Is that the saint that goes with the Edwards? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, Georgia, you, you, you teach us. You teach at St. Edwards too? Yes, we're colleagues. Oh, awesome. <laughs> Perfect. Okay. Well, maybe we'll get you, we'll, we'll give you all some ideas that you can uh, incorporate together. <laughs> always better. I always think it's better when you do it in a group, right? It, oh, you'd be sure. more. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, somebody, is it a high school in Paris? Paris, France? Wow. Actually, Paris, Texas, sorry, I didn't specify. Oh, okay. <laughs> I wondered about that. Very Texas, that. like little, the movie. Yeah, that's a little bit closer. Yes, that's a little right? bit closer. Yes, correct. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So what do you like best about teaching heritage learners? Hmm. Somebody teaches at Castleberry High School. So this is interesting. We've got some high school. We've got some middle school. We've got some... Uh, university teachers. Ah, seeing the moon from embarrassment to confidence. Yeah, that's always mm -hmm. fun, isn't it? Yep. Mm -hmm. They get my jokes. Oh my gosh. I remember the very first, my very first class that I taught, my very first heritage speaker class. I was like, oh my God, they understood my joke. <laughs> <laughs> I, in fact, that's how I can tell when I'm teaching beginning Spanish at, at BU. That's how I can tell when, when they definitely are not in the right level, right? When they're laughing at my jokes in Spanish, they definitely should not be in Spanish one. <laughs> <laughs> Sixty-five, sixty-five, 
We have similar taste in music sometimes. <laughs> yeah, no, my students. I well, I'm whoever answered that might be younger than me. So, it, but one of the things I've learned is that sometimes they mention people. I'm like, oh, I don't know that person. Yeah, and somebody said in the in the chat that they are learning more about the heritage speakers because they are starting their program yeah in their schools and oh perfect perfect i think this is That's a great perfect. venue to actually learn about materials we're gonna share yeah. materials yeah. at the end i mean yeah, in all honesty collaborating with molly uh, i'm a linguist and while i know a lot about critical language awareness and pedagogies on language i always need more narratives um uh i mean poems uh, documentaries and you know we are not always uh, as linguist on top of all those, so I I have learned a lot collaborating and through the through th through the Quirl and on all these websites I've yeah I have I mean exponentially added uh, materials to my to my class yeah understand the culture better oh yeah of course they understand the culture better yeah 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 so now what do you find most challenging about it. Mm -hmm. They don't know how to describe what they already know. Yeah. Oh, Valeria, I can talk in Spanish. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> even though we're supposed to speak in Span so much in Span Spanish, even at the beginning levels, it's with the L two learners, it's so much more challenging. You constantly have to think about what language, what what words you're using, and whether or not they understand you. Challenging. Um... Grammar. Yeah. Today I was, I had a very good class on mm -hmm. actually, I had a very good class on preposition stranding. I mm -hmm. added this to my class this semester oh. because they have the preposition <laughs> at the end. Right. So I learned, I taught them and I'm totally happy to share what I've done. I taught them how to um, combine sentences using complex relative clauses like en la que, por la que. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and, and, classes. Yeah, and I it, it just worked today. It was amazing. I mean, they are, and I always teach it from a perspective of you know how to do it. You know that I just have you just have to get the metalinguistic awareness on it. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think the last question, the last answer was really interesting. We still struggle convincing students to enroll in the heritage class rather than the language learner track. So yeah. I'm hoping that by the end of this uh, webinar, you will have uh, materials that will make them want to take your course <laughs> because, yeah, oh, they take the L they want to take the L2 classes because they think they're easier. OK, so, well, let me let me tell you a little bit. Uh, well, Maria's going to tell you about our first Maria is going to tell you a little bit about our collaboration and then I'll tell you how I came up with the curriculum I came up with. Yeah, and I, I'm going to start saying that I am a linguist and I have taught this class for over a decade or more. And I have gone through the whole like getting mad because they didn't, they were not understanding grammar and then going through a more critical language awareness approach and then including narratives. So I'm going through a process and a trajectory that it's not, re doesn't resemble how I used to teach. So when I hear people saying that they rebel against grammar, it it is also because obviously they have never been exposed to that type of grammar. So, I mean, I, I'm, I'm happy to share my materials about how I teach grammar. I, it's something that I do actually ancillary. It's never the, the, the main aspect of my class. And that's something that Molly has definitely taught me. Um, I, we met at the National uh, Heritage Speakers Conference in 2022. It was held in Harvard. Uh, and we were both very interested on uh, this idea of intra-Latino dynamics because I work at a PWI. So I have a lot of students that are first generation, but I also have international Latin American students. And I have students from all hierarchies of language learning from very prestigious varieties of Spanish, monolingual, to the more hybrid, more students that have, ne that have learned the language through their abuelita. Right, so that that creates huge insecurities when you are exposed to that uh, range variation in the classroom, and it leads to a lot of problems if you are only focusing on grammar, right? Mm -hmm. Right, because there is a lot of surveillance, language surveillance going on among them. So we uh, decided to to tackle this idea that we wanted to in collaborate in the interdisciplinarily 
And we wanted a, a, a pedagogy that actually merged something that hasn't been merged that much, which, which is the literature and linguistic field. And uh, then we started actually collecting data. We wrote an IRB. Um, Molly's IRB, I have to admit, is the most difficult IRB yeah. I've ever <laughs> done in my life. We It took us a month to pass on that it IRB. It was two months. <laughs> it was two months. And they were asking us questions, so just to gather data on this on this class. And then we uh, just have uh, the acceptance letter a week ago, right? And we have a forthcoming article in the Spanish as a Heritage Language Journal. This presentation is not about, it's not an academic presentation. We're just gonna talk about the materials and provide the materials that we use in our classes. It's not a real, like an academic presentation. It's just more material centered. Yeah. So here's a sort of the basic structure of the of the course. Um, so I started out with um, hold on. It says my screen sharing is paused. Did I do that? I didn't mean to do that. I don't know what I said that. Um, okay, so uh, basically I organized it around three topics: Latinidad or La Latino identity, familismo or family bonds, and then Latino communities. And I have different materials that I use that obviously all three topics dovetail, but um, that's how I sort of guided them through the course. So I chose all narratives about and by US Latinos. And that I think is one of the things that makes my course unique. I do have, there are other people at my school that teach uh, Spanish as a heritage language. And a lot of them use uh, Latin American materials, and that's great too, but I really wanted them to be able to have materials that spoke to their reality. And so as a result, my materials are bilingual, sometimes they're in English, sometimes they're in Spanish, sometimes they're translations. We used, um, I'm not your perfect Mexican daughter, we used the Spanish translation of it. Um, and uh, so one of the things that I focused on um, in, 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 through narrative is perspective taking, reducing prejudice and understanding others' emotions. So really looking at can narrative teach uh, students empathy for others who are different than them. So, these are some of the materials that I use um, to discuss who is included in Latinidad. You know, what who is Latino? Who is who is who is who's considered part of Latinidad? Who's not? And um, one of the so there's an essay that's in essence called "The Secret Latina" by Veronica Chambers, and we're going to give you a at the end. We're going to I'm going to share my syllabus with you that has all of these inform all of these texts, so you don't have to write everything down unless you want to. Um, Chino Japonés, which is a uh, a, sh a short uh, short story by Maria uh, Mari Carmen Ojera. She's Bolivian, about a, a a Japanese Bolivian boy who gets mocked for his Asian features, and Miriam Niente, which is a film um, from the Dominican Republic about a biracial uh, girl who's having her quinceañera. Um, and these are all so what one of the one of the things that we talk about is, you know, who 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 do we sometimes forget when we talk about Latinidad, right? Um, we talk about pan-ethnicity, we talk about colorism and anti-blackness, which is a, 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 a topic that really comes out in Medio Ambiente. Um, a couple other materials that I use are Names Nombres by Julia Alvarez. La Gringa, which is a play by Carmen Rivera, um, she's Puerto Rican, and Pollito Chicken by Ana Lidia Vega. So these are all really great texts that help you, help the students think about what does it mean to be Latino in the U.S.? Mm -hmm. Um, and hi, we do have a couple of quotes from that we from the data that we collected. Um, this was an African American and Puerto Rican student who identified more with his African American side than his than his Puerto Rican side, and he really loved the Secret Latina um, because she had the same experience. And so this, I loved this quote from him. And so instead of me just being confused and trying to be one of the other Secret Latinos, like I'm both, and I can just be me. 
So hearing that and reading that, wow, I can connect to my culture because being mixed is a culture of its own. And then there was another student, white Colombian American, who at first was kind of resistant to some of our discussions on who wasn't who wasn't included in Latinidad and some of the colorism and homophobia of Latinidad. And he kind of pushed back and was a little bit prickly. And then we read Chino Japones, and this is what he said. El sentir empatía de la forma que me hacen sentir estas lecturas me ha sido de mucha ayuda para entender la importancia de estas discusiones que en un principio no me parecían tan importantes. Mm -hmm. He really made a, 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 a lovely sort of, he had a lovely learning journey that was, that was really fun to document. So Maria wants to share something that she did in, when she was talking about Latinidad. Yeah, I wanted to share this in the midst of Latinidad. Uh, so my students, after reading the the um, narratives that Molly uh, did, we actually had this coincided with uh, Spanish Heritage Month. So we did an art project, uh, a photo contest, and we uh, talked. We we asked them to talk about what does Latinidad mean meant to me. And this student came actually with uh, this very beautiful story about intergenerational suffering. And she focused on the idea that um, that uh, that that you know that she oh Molly's you're kind of moving. I got the wrong I got the wrong one. So do yeah. you have your do you have I'm sorry do you have your uh, oh I can I can talk it. about it yeah well she yeah. just okay. um, she um, she referred back to these ideas of Latinidad as something that she's learned how to deal uh, in her family uh, through intergenerational trauma. Um, she talked about how the, the the drawing is actually inspired on um, her uncle that was in um, in a California prison, and in the in the and and she showed her how to uh, draw uh, like as if as if she was tattooing. Um, so in any case, the the um, the photo contest was a great idea to include as part of Heritage Month, but especially it was the narratives that gave the topics to. Uh, how to talk about Latinidad um, in a more multidimensional way, like taking on different positionalities, like uh, white identifying or uh, like being a woman Latina or what is to be a non-white identifying Latino, etc. cetera. Um, so this is what she actually wrote. Um, in reflecting on my own form of Latinidad, I reflect on my relationships with my family. Intergenerational trauma in many forms has left an indelible mark of my family as in many immigrant families, but the beautiful byproducts of the sufferings we survive and resiliency and subversive joy. This piece, this piece is inspired by a connection I experienced between La Virgen and maternal love and, and time spent with my grandma while she did my hair and told me stories. It is stylistically influenced by artwork created by my uncle while she was incarcerated at Harkins to Chicago tattooing on the West Coast. Yeah, and so this was part of the, the photo contest that we did as part of Heritage Month. And I think that, yeah, making them think about Latinidad in a more, yeah, multidimensional, intersectional ways is what prompted this, this actually learner to, 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 to draw such a beautiful piece of art. Yeah, so then uh, thanks to Molly, <laughs> I had the book, but I also, uh, this is a book that is, yo no soy tu perfecta hija mexicana, they are going to make a movie uh, out of the, this book. America Ferrera. Yeah, America Ferrera. It. And it's been used uh, in, now in American, in, in high schools, I've heard. Um, we, um, we use it because it reflects the story of many of our first generation students that have gone through this trauma of trying to explain to their parents that they are first generation, that they they want to go to the university. So the main character is Julia, who um, whose uh, sister dies in a very tragic uh, accident. And Julia starts, uh, it becomes very depressed. So the, the novel talks about many topics that resonate with my, my, our students, for example, Familismo, we touch a lot around the concept of familismo. I, th I think familismo is a topic that should be integral in Spanish for heritage speakers class because everything resonates back to the family, even language. Mental health, uh, it talks about immigration because then we discover that the mother was actually, um, was sexually assaulted in the border. Uh, and that comes later. We, we talk about intergenerational trauma and how that, how that affects 
Julia, right? Because there's a secret, there's a lot of silencing in the family. And we talk a lot, sexual, a lot about sexuality because one of the characters is actually uh, gay and Julia doesn't like him, but then she discovers through this coming of age that he's suffering. So it's a great, I mean, great, great novel to include all of these topics. Students really sexuality. resonate with it. They talk yeah. a lot about how they how they feel like it reflects a lot of their own experiences. So um, in my composition, uh, in what, what we do after this, this section is the students write a three page paper on uh, on on the novel and in which they have to analyze a topic. So um, I have shared my documents. I make them write in topics, subtopics, and then they have a glossary and then they have to give me the references in MLA. So they are kind of practicing how to be scholars of literature in a way. And that's something that I had to learn as a linguist. And I'm happy to have learned it because it's fascinating <laughs> and it's very useful for them. And then uh, after that, because in my class, there is a lot of um, the students that come from more privileged, they have to talk about how their positionality is different than, than that of the characters. And so they have to reflect on their own experiences. And we talk about beliefs and norms in Latino cultures and how that differs from their own uh, backgrounds. So I will also share that with you. Um, it it actually it and then they share it right because they realize oh my god I don't come from the same positionality as this other student, and that's a very important part of the process. Yeah. So um, this is a this is the comment of one of my students. Um, sometimes when we over focus on language and grammar, we forget about the complex identities that our, our students bring into the classroom, and especially the identity politics that are among Latino communities. Uh, this is a heritage learner, queer Latina, uh, who's, who did a beautiful, um, very well-written essay about uh, uh, queerness in the novel. And she said, Comparto muchos atributos con los personajes de la novela, especialmente Julia y Juanga, porque yo también tengo conflictos con los valores religiosos de mi cultura debido a, identidad com a mi identidad como mujer y queer. Entonces, esto es una cosa that I feel that if we over focus on just critical language awareness or we just focus on one aspect of language, we forget that these type of emotionalities are in our classrooms. And that, that's what something that we can bring through literature, I feel. It's, it's very powerful. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I feel like literature is... There's a weird background of them. There we go. Um, one of the things I really love about literature is I do really think it really helps you understand the perspectives of others. And they've, there's been some psychological studies on this. Um, I went to a great uh, uh, session at NECTFL one year, the Northeast Conference for the Teaching of Foreign Language. And it was on the theater of the oppressed by Augusto Boal. Um, I don't know if any of you have read it. You might know Freire's The uh, Pedagogy of the oh, Oppressed. Mm -hmm. It's based on that. And it is it encourages <laughs> people to, uh, to have... Oh, we can hear someone in the background. Maybe I'll mute somebody. There we go. Um, so basically, there's a, it, it, it really encourages people to, to think about what it feels like to be someone else, especially an oppressed person, or to see, to see how they feel being the oppressor, um, and to play the two roles and, and to and alternate the two roles and to try to find common ground. Um, the other thing I also do is I have them write from the perspective of a character, so um, one time uh, I had them write a dating profile for Julia because Julia talks about her aunt. She was like, if my aunt had a dating profile, it would read blah, 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 blah. So I had the students write a dating profile for Julia. And it was perfect because in the next few chapters, she ends up getting a boyfriend. So uh, we get to talk about whether or not they predicted the kind of boyfriend that she would want. Um, so this was what somebody had said, intelectual, académica, feminista y escritora. Levemente terca y muy directa. Tengan paciencia. Si no has leído un libro recientemente, hazte un favor y no me mandes mensaje. Buena suerte con mi familia. Mi hermana está muerta. Rest in peace. 
And so this is just something we did in class in pairs and, or in groups of three. And it was really fun and was a really great way to get them using language. And also look at, look at, I, I thought it was really great that they used the, uh, the commands. Um, I didn't ask them to use the commands. And then we talked about that later because, because Julia is kind of bossy. And so it was kind of interesting to talk about what kinds of, instead of just doing like a pure gr grammatical analysis of what kind of grammar structures do you need to convey certain messages? Mm -hmm. The other thing that I do is I, I do close reading and there was a there was a time there's a section right here in the novel where her um, English teacher is helping her apply for college and he wants her to write his her essay about her parents immigration um, experience and she's scared to do that um, because it's a secret. Um, and so we have this really, it, it, I end up having a really interesting conversation with my students about the words, right? Because he, she says, son ilegales. And he's like, indocumentados, me corrige. And she says, mi familia dice que son ilegales o mojados. Nadie dice indocumentados. And so he goes, well, es una palabra muy estigmatizante. No me gusta. Tampoco extranjeros ilegales. Eso es aún más repulsivo. So finally, she says, bueno, indocumentados, concedo, right? So we have this interesting discussion about the way in which language is sometimes forced upon us by in an educational setting. And there's another section in the novel where he's talking about teaching them standard English, right? Mm -hmm. So these are things that we get to, they, they're, they're good moments to do uh, to have a longer discussion on on the use of Spanish on the use of the kinds of language they use in the in the in the ho at home versus the language in the classroom the sometimes the ways in which language is forced upon them even though teachers mean well I don't know Maria did you want to uh yeah elaborate upon this more too yes i i do more i do a lot on critical language awareness so i always start kind of inductively telling them that standard language ideologies can be powerful but also very oppressive but um i like this approach of teaching it through novels because for example one of my students said in this, they they have different uh, different on the ground perspectives about how language works, and they he said, well, sometimes uh, we as Latinos uh, internalize uh, our own prejudices, our own like our own hate, our own self hate, and I thought I have never thought about that. So I think that sometimes it's better to kind of test them on what they think it's happening than just exposing ideology ideas about language that can be very difficult to grasp right so i do it gradually um and never like standard language ideologies here is what it is because it's not gonna work they're gonna be like yeah but i still need to learn the standard okay now let's first see how you talk about language so yeah i i i've been doing a lot of that through the novels yeah, another very um, important piece in the in that course that I think was um, kind of relevant, especially given the political <laughs> climate, uh, was include uh, activism, apart on activism, and uh, we uh, did that through the documentary Dolores. Um, this is a PBS documentary. It's in Canopy. It's fantastic. It talks about uh, the story of Dolores Huerta, but more than that, it talks about the intersectionality issues with uh, being a woman activist. She is a very complex character. She had to um, kind of leave her family behind to become an activist. She was always relegated to a second position in the uh, like activist movement. In the uh, union, in the right? union, in the United Farm Workers, yeah. Right, right. So I think that this... Um, portrays a very unheard uh, story of the woman who uh, who who actually fought for for um, yeah the political movement so I I think that um, it also joins very well the idea of familismo and activism and it gives a broader perspective of how minorities work with human rights and it demonstrates the necessity of of something that if we don't include these histories and we over focus on grammar, we are forgetting the idea of, of including uh, ethnic studies, right, in our courses. 
so um, this is actually a first the comment of a first generation uh, female heritage learner who said that eh, creo que esta película destaca mucho de los temas que hemos tratado. So she's already making connections between familismo, los retos a los que se enfrentan las mujeres debido a las ideologías tradicionales. Eh, las mujeres se están emancipando de estas ideologías tradicionales tóxicas, que también es otro tipo de empowerment y, 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 de, y de consolidación a través de identidades a través de la clase de herencia, ¿no? de sentir que no eres solo la lengua, pero también eres mujer que estás intentando ir en contra de un mundo conservador y patriarcal. ¿no? Yeah. I wanted to mention one thing. Um... For those of you who I don't know, for, I know like for example, uh, Christian, if you teach at Bowdoin, you have you have students from all over the nation. Um, the the only the only ones of my students that knew Dolores Huerta were my students from California because California has an ethnic studies requirement in high school, and everybody else, especially mm -hmm. the ones from Texas, right now my class is half Texans. And even though we're in Boston and they don't, they have not studied this. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, no, my students in Texas didn't know. And luckily she came the year before. I think they knew more about her, but she's amazing. Yeah. Dolores Huerta came to our campus, but they, they didn't know about the story, the whole story. And yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, we, I think part of the class is activating a little, a little bit their activist side. Uh, many of them are already activists in their communities. That's something that I didn't know, but I started to, to ask them around and they have they are volunteering in hospitals. They are volunteering in many different places. So I don't know, it was a, it was a good choice adding this. But this student was not. This was one of my I'm students not. and he oh, was actually okay. talked about his trauma being from Colombia because his idea of unions and leftist social groups was was that of violence and so he said yeah. this was his this was the first time that he saw a positive representation of act of leftist activism is what the way he put it yeah i remember that in, in the paper yeah i remember yeah, that. that was really Just interesting yeah so another great great um documentary that's on canopy as well is the infiltrators and it is half it's like a half film half documentary because it's a it takes it's a documentary about some activists that infiltrated a detention center in Broward County uh Florida and of course they couldn't film in the detention center so once they go into the detention center it's actors playing the roles and it's super interesting um and the students really uh They, their eyes were really opened to the experience that immigrants, that undocumented immigrants experience, right? Um, and the issue of belonging and, uh, and again, activism. So um, I had, I, I have, a, I had a student from Puerto Rico and she said, This class class taught me how lucky I am to have uh, my American citizenship as a Puerto Rican. As part of the Latinx community, I was embarrassingly unaware of the details that describe the hardships of immigration. Uh, the difference between an, uh, you know, an undocumented immigrant and, and students who come to the US to study is, is, is very, very different, right? So um, community building is a big part of both of our courses. Um, we do a lot of small group work, pair work, discussion boards outside of class. Um, I have my students do group presentations. We use Mentimeter as a way of doing collaborative knowledge production. And then of course, we always try and use community cultural events whenever possible. One of the things that I love is I have the Boston Latino, um, Boston Cinefest Latino, and I took my students there and it, they really had such an amazing experience. Um, so uh, Maria wants to share what she did yeah. at, at the, the, the group she started at TCU. Yeah, well, I, I want to leave this on a very good positive note on how transformative the change of my curriculum uh, has been um, by kind of opening it more to the students to discuss topics that are related to their experiences nowadays, like familismo, being first generation. We also have another module on belonging to a PWI, what is to belong. That was that has been fantastic to include. 
um, we actually have, I have been able to collect more, their, understand their voices, because I think it comes from you to understand them, right? Mm -hmm. and 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 they have last semester they created a, a very beautiful um you know group and we were able to create a a, a, a club uh on dedicated just to heritage speakers they came from the ground and i think that's a testament to to how much you can do if you ignite their their passion for their language but also for what they are going through you know like they an understanding of what they are going through so yeah, that's it. And I think I, that yeah, Molly. I think that that dovetails with those that uh, those of you who said that you can't get them to take the heritage language class, right? If you're building a community and you're like, hey, you want to take this class because this is going to be the only class you're going to take with all other Latinos, right? Like you're you're going to be this is a this is a course for you and you only. Um, my students are always like, wow, coming from Boston University, you know, like they don't they don't come into classes and see that kind of representation um, in the classroom. So this was what one of my students said. It's amazing that we are all able to connect with each other based on a movie, a book, an article, a podcast, an infographic, or a simple conversation. Um, and some of the other things that students said were uh, things like, I had different conversations. I have Latino friends in, in, you know, on campus, but I had different conversations in this class. We never really talk about what it means to be Latino outside of class, right? But in this class we did, and, it, and she's like, and then we would bring those discussions back in, out, out into the community when we would talk to each other. So we have a bunch of, uh, of links that we are gonna share with you. So if you wanna click on them, the first one I believe is my most recent uh, uh, syllabus. Some is uh, a couple of them are Maria's uh, inform Maria's uh, different um, syllabi and also activities. Maria, I don't know if you want to say yeah. anything else about yes. this. Yes, so yeah, I mean, uh, we we are. I'm happy to share anything. Honestly, yes. I, I have grammar grammar powerpoints. I have. Yeah, it was, I was. I know for people who are very oriented on grammar, I, I'm going to teach a class on the gerund because I know it's kind of an obsession these days, oh, yeah. like overuse of the gerund. Yeah. But in all honesty, yeah. for me, that's part of the class, but it's not all the class by any means. I'm not a grammar police. I'm not there to um, just force the language, you know, when they haven't really acquired or is the community language, you know. So one of the things that I do with the novel is I, I I look at here's where they use the subjunctive. Let's talk about why they used it here. Here's uh, here's a whole paragraph where she uses where she's talking about the future and she uses the future simple. Here's the preterite and the imperfect. Right. We use the actual novel to see real life use of these different structures and just kind of remind them of what they already know. Because yeah. they use the preterite and the imperfect, they just don't call it the preterite and the imperfect, right? Um, they use the future simple, they use commands, they use the subjunctive, right? They use it all, they just don't call it those 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 words. Mm -hmm. So um, I think I will since we're since we're small group. Yeah. I mean, people can write if they want, but I think I'll just stop and say. Hey, do you have questions? Are there are there things that more things that you'd like to know? What what else can we share with you? And um, Molly and Maria, we would uh, love to also be able to add your syllabi to the website. Absolutely, um, and copy um, that are we have kind of updated the text website. It looks kind of new and improved. Um, Right, Marco? <laughs> Looks nice. And um, it would be great to have your your syllabi on there as well. Sure, sure. Great. No, I mean, we're very, we're very passionate about open, open educational resources. Yeah. And we want to share it. We want to share this with everyone, because I feel like we have so there's so many great uh, materials that can be used. Um, and, you know, every time I, I go to one of these, I learn new, a new I learn new things, too. And, and, and it's really great to share them all. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I'm the same way. And so any questions? Um, we have, yeah, not 15 minutes, but 10, 
plus minutes. If anybody has any questions for the presenters, yes, Christian, Christian. Has, right? Yeah, thank you for the presentation. I was so excited, and also I'm I'm a linguist, mm -hmm. uh, and also I, I will reach out to you, Maria, to see how you combine also the literature part with the linguistic uh, linguistic side because I'm not an, uh, in that uh, field, but. I do have a question because here at Bowden, I'm teaching a heritage Spanish class. This is the second time I've taught for the class. And it's really interesting to see how I had two different completely groups. Like my previous group in the spring was like heritage, like the majority of them, they were come from Texas, from California, from all, all, all over the, the country. But this semester I also had um, non-Latino, non-heritage speakers, because they were eager to learn more about the communities where they live. Like they were from Texas, they were from California, they live in New York. So they were familiar with the community. So that's why they wanted to take the class. And we didn't have that restriction to see how that uh, this class uh, was this semester. And I just want to hear from you if you have any advice or if you have had some classes when you have mixed uh, groups, because something that I'm noticing is that or is that they don't connect with the uh, familiaridad, with experiences of not growing up in a Spanish uh, home, but they do feel have this uh, awareness of the community and um, probably the struggles that they listen to other people. So maybe an idea of the activities or uh, how you approach those uh, context situations. Well, I can actually tell you that I teach this course as well in English um, as part of our first year writing seminar um, every fall. And I have the majority are Latino, but there are Chinese, Indian, American, like people from all different places. I had someone who was in a, uh, an immersion school. And so that's why they wanted to take the class. So um, I, I have found that they really actually love all the materials one of the things that I've noticed is that they struggle a little bit on how on, with their positionality right like how to talk about these topics while seeming sensitive and that's why I always go back to the 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 narratives right you're not and you're not going to necessarily be an expert on latinidad but you're going to be an expert on how it's represented in this novel or how it's represented in this text or in this movie right so i always remind them to look back at the that you don't have to speak from your own personal experience but you're going to speak from the experience of the characters right or the experience of of having read this these read the book or 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 seen the movie so um i i christian so it's a class if i not i mean it's a class that has second language learners and heritage speakers yeah. uh, in this in our department we have these classes called advanced spanish local to global oh. uh, yeah super interesting we have merged uh we have we don't have writings right we don't have like the typical writing grammar and oral difference mm. and one of the things that we are definitely trying to do is infuse local and global perspectives. So for the local, we have created a module on food and learning about food in Texas. And they learn it through, Molly gave that to me, the ta ta tacos, what's the name of that? Taco Chronicles. Taco Chronicles, oh my God. De taco. Oh my God, it's so good. <laughs> I yeah, use it now I, in all my classes. Yeah, with, through food, you know, and then they have to do the commands. So that like they have to present on uh, on a, on a dish and they have to like uh, record the 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 presentation on the dish and then they have to present the historical background of that dish. So I think that there are topics that resonate with second language learners that you can start introducing or like studying a a, a Hispanic Latino figure that they haven't learned about, so that you 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 have heritage speakers understanding that that's. The, Spanish is the domestic language. You are learning this for a reason. You are the center core, like the, the center of, of, of our cultural experience in the classroom. Mm -hmm. But doing it maybe more like through, you know, maybe food, maybe um, esto, learning about historical figures, right? And in the global, we added something on tourism in Spain because actually they many of them are going to study abroad and I'm from Spain and I'm like, I don't like the over touristification of uh, Spain. So we added the documentary Bye Bye Barcelona. Mm. 
And in that way, both of them merge because both of them are going to be uh, studying abroad, heritage speakers. We have a lot of heritage speakers studying abroad. So topics yeah. like that. Yeah. Um, I do, with the Taco Chronicles, I also do a, a trivia game. And I, I look up all this information on like what's the percent what's the percentage of Latinos in Phoenix or what's the what's the what's the state that has the highest percentage of Latinos or wh what how many Spanish speakers are in the United States like all this different sort of like little facts and figures and they're always like and and, and it ends up being really fun and they work in groups and they're trying really hard to figure out what the right answer is and they're always so surprised it's always like so much more than they think it is right like mm -hmm. it, so that's the other thing that's really cool and I teach them a little bit about like el tratado de Guadalupe Hidalgo and like how what state what states were not part of the U.S. right like when did they so all these things like they that's a that's a that can be a really fun way that's what I do when I when I teach the Taco Chronicles I, I bring that in too and it and it and it and it's a really fun interactive way to 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 teach them about communities that they might not know about yeah that's amazing. Thank you so much for this. And I'll definitely reach out to you later in an email. So thanks. Oh, yeah. Sonia. Oh, yes. Um, my question is about the Taco Chronicles. Is it, um, I, where do we access this or? It's on Netflix. It's on Netflix. Oh, and okay. Most, okay. Most, and it's in, they're in Spanish and most of them are, they start out the first two seasons are from Mexico and then they move the last, like the third season goes to the U.S. And it focuses on um, uh, the, the U.S., the whole season that's in the U.S. focuses on different cities. Okay. So it's, yeah, it's really cool. There are, to some of them are like the taco speaks and like, yeah, oh. it's a really, it's a very, it's a fun. I that actually have a lot of great. There's also the Tale of Two Kitchens, which is about um, mm. a a Mexican chef who's got a, a, a restaurant in San Francisco and a restaurant in Mexico City. Mm. I also have used the chef's table. Chef's um, the table. chef's table, it, there's the one on Barbacoa, Cristina Martinez in Chicago. And then there's also, um, there's a couple of them from Spain, um, like uh, Michelin star, restaurants mm. and it's it, it's it's interesting to, that that they they enjoy that uh that that's I do that in my second language and in my um and in my uh heritage classes too so th these are all Netflix series these are all Netflix series okay. yeah thank you uh there's also a new Netflix show that just came out I don't know if anybody's seen it it's Secreto del Rio which is about the mushes in Oaxaca it's super interesting. Mm. It's a little bit telenovela, but you know, um, but but yeah, no, I watch everything. Anything comes out in Spanish, and I'm like, I just start watching it and and see how I can incorporate it into class. I know. I I personally think food and music, music and food, it yeah, yeah. it unites us as humans, and it's yeah. it's the most wonderful thing to highlight when teaching yeah. Spanish. Yeah, definitely. Uh, 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 speaking of music, one of my very, very favorite videos is Latino America by Calle 13. Oh, yeah. And it's a really powerful, powerful. Mm. Oh, another show that I that we didn't talk about today, because the last time we presented um, at Actful, um, there were a lot of high school teachers, high school teachers, and it's a little bit racy, but Vida, which was mm. on Stars and is now on Hulu. Um, and you can buy the first season for like five or six dollars on Amazon Prime, I think. It's really, really interesting. Um, activities that we do with the movies or the series. We tie them all to the, the topics, right? So let me see if I have one of the things I love to do is ask them to describe the characters. And so I, I use Menti to ask them, what words would you use to describe the characters? And it's really interesting, especially because from my perspective, I have students from different countries, right? So it's really different, like the Dominican, the, the Mexicans, the Puerto Ricans, they all, the Peruvians, they have all different language that they use. And so it's really interesting because we, that's one of the things I do with collaborative knowledge production is we all teach each other, right? And then somebody will be like, I don't know what that word is. And so I'll say, okay, that somebody needs to explain what that word means, right? And so we end up having really interesting discussions. And it's also a vocabulary builder. I um, also, 
Yeah, I also have those years uh, for my, yo no soy tu perfecta, uh, mexicana, and I have created five dossiers. I don't know if I can say, I have like three of them, but I, I integrate a vocabulary section. I do a pero and sino. We work with transition words, like all the typical like things that you do in the heritage classroom. But first of all, we start with like an analysis of the novel, an intertextual analysis of the novel. So I can share like these materials for sure. I mean, yeah, I, that's, I do it by sections. Like Molly had it very well divided and then I followed and then I created dossiers. Yeah, yeah. So but Valeria had an interesting question. She said that these these novel that these discussions seem partic uh, particularly complex. I think we're make, I think we're speaking at a high level right now, but you can take you can take them down to really basics. Yeah. A really lovely one that I did was um, Names Nombres by Julia Alvarez, and it's about how she comes to the United States and her name is is mispronounced and 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 nobody ever nobody ever ever nobody ever calls her by her right name, right? I mean that is something everyone can relate to, everyone, right? Um, and the 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 um, I'm not your perfect Mexican daughter. She's a high school student, right? So the way in which she interacts, I mean maybe it wouldn't be perfect for middle school, but it's really good for uh, for high school um so i think it's just a matter of of starting from what the students see from it you know from a from a basic like identity level and then and then you can move up in terms of the complexity and familismo is a is a fan it's a fancy term to mm -hmm. basically mean that the family is is the primordial mm -hmm. value and that you uh that your family and your family's needs always take priority mm -hmm. over the individual yeah and so that's something to that's something you can discuss really easily i mean one of the things that i do a lot of with all of these materials is ask them about uh, values. What values are expressed mm -hmm. in this text? What are values are expressed? Mm -hmm. in, these two people are having a conversation. So when Julia Julia meets her her boyfriend, he says, "Where are you from?" And she says, "I'm from I'm from Chicago." Blah 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 blah. And he goes, "Where are you from?" From mm -hmm. right. So we have a really interesting discussion about that. Right. Like when have you been questioned? When is your when has your identity been questioned? Like he doesn't believe that she's from Chicago, and she sasses back and says, "Oh, you mean you want to know what kind of brown I am?" Mm -hmm. And so it's a really interesting, you know, interchange. I mean, one of the things you could do with the novel at the middle school level is just take little parts of the novel, right? Like even just like little interactions could be really interesting, almost like a short story. Um, of course, Casa Mango Street is another one that, that works for that. And Casa Mango Street has a great uh, Spanish translation. Like the one where she she's dying to take a sandwich to class, right? She really, really wants her mom to make her like a peanut butter and jelly sandwich or a bologna sandwich. And her mom's like, what? I thought, you know, this isn't what we make. And so she sends her to school with a sandwich de arroz, right? Because from her experience that she doesn't understand the idea of a, of a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, right? So just little moments of like trying to fit in or trying to... to you know, just those 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 scholastic interactions can be really interesting. Emily, I think that you wanted to share some form of some forms at the end of the. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. I absolutely, I can put it in the chat thing. because I'm not entirely confident that with this weird new computer that I can share my screen. So I think what I'm going to do is the dorky way around this. I'm going to send you. First, the link, everyone, to um, just look yeah. at the slide. But then I will also send you so that you have an abundance. Of yeah, people. please give us feedback. We always love to hear from you. And then um, here, this pat, this last link is to the survey. Um, and yes, we really do read all of them and take into account what was helpful. And we plan our webinars based on the content that... Um, you guys put in the survey. Um, one of the things that I'm going to take, besides some of the great activities, I love the idea of the dating profile. Um, mm -hmm. Just the comment that you made about, um, sometimes it's so difficult to get our heritage learners to sign up for the heritage class because they have enough 
input to know that they don't sound like their parents and grandparents. Mm -hmm. And that's dangerous. They have just enough to know that they don't sound like what they think is some imaginary mm -hmm. idealized bilingual that's not really real. And by saying to them, yes, but you're going to be in a class with other Latinos that are like you, um, you're you're going to have a place that is for you where you can have conversations with people like you. I think that's a great way to frame it. Um, I struggle sometimes with uh, not, they don't want enough linguistic information to know why the L2 class is not compatible with what they already know. Um, and I think that's a great way to kind of frame the discussion about why this class is going to be a better option for you. So thank you for that. Yeah, I hope that I hope that works. I think I really I find that they're super thrilled to be in the class. Yeah, so, they always love it once they're there. It's mm -hmm. I usually yeah. find like the first week my throat hurts because I talk to myself and nobody wants to talk to me the first week. And then after yeah. that, we don't have to talk much. They do a yeah. lot. Um, so when but, I have, I've had a quiet, I had a quiet group this semester and somebody, a couple of people brought that up, that they were disappointed that other people weren't chatting. And so I actually have come up with some other things to sort of make, to sort of force them to participate. I mean, this is a little bit dorky, but the, you know, the little stuffed animal, it was like a little cameo or something. And I just like toss it around and then they have to toss it to the next person. They toss it to oh, the next yeah. person. It really worked. Um, the other thing too is is that one of my students led class discussion and she did the hot seats, and so she you would pick somebody and she asked them to represent one of the characters in the novel, mm -hmm. and the other people in the class had to ask questions to the to the character, and so it was really interesting because it allowed them to again to get into somebody else's perspective, but it also allowed them to show how well they had read the the, the text. Mm -hmm. um, so. So yeah, there's a lot of things that you can do that sort of, you know, um, get get them going a little bit more. I love yeah, those the, are great oh, ideas. Thank you. Oh, I, I think love, one I think person. Oh, did this is Sonia. Oh, Diana, did you have a question? Oh, Sonia, I think Sonia is ahead of me. <laughs> oh, okay. oh, okay. Okay, just a quick um, um, comment. Or question the the character so you have a student play the part of a character from whatever you're reading and the students have to ask um the character the question so oh, like why wonderful. did you do why did you do that mm -hmm. or what do you really think about Julia or how do you feel about Julia going to college or you okay. know what uh why didn't you tell Julia this Julia why didn't you tell your mother this right uh like things like that or like okay. when, you know Julia why uh do you think your relationship with Connor is gonna last like it was really interesting that's a all great the they, great they, idea. all these questions the other thing that I do is I also do letters like I have them write a letter mm -hmm. like um Julia goes to Mexico at some point she has a mental break health breakdown and so her parents send her to Mexico which is a whole nother part like sending your family you're sending going back home as an immigrant is a really interesting discussion too and wow. so she sends her back to her family and so we I have them write you know like an email or a letter to her mother while she's in Mexico so things like that are, are, are fun as well. Neat. Thank you. Diana. I think. Um, yeah. Um, Maria, I think you mentioned that you are from Spain. Yes. I was, I was wondering, do students ask you if you identify as Latina or how you identify yourself and, and why, like, if you don't identify as Latina, why not? Or uh, that's, that's a very good question. That's an excellent question, our, our, our own positionalities in the classroom, right? I'm Basque. I mean, oh. I'm not like, I don't even, I, I do Basque studies. So the way I, I um, kind of relate to them is by telling them the story of language oppression in my own country. And the fact that my parents, uh, my dad lost his language uh, because he couldn't be taught in schools. And they were punished mm -hmm. for for speaking it. Mm -hmm. So I don't go into the Latino Hispanic debate. Um, I do okay. go in terms of 
uh, them understanding what it, what does it mean, what is the Latino term, the Hispanic term, etc. In terms yeah. of my mm -hmm. own positionality, I tell them the way I come to this classroom is through a history of language oppression that I have also studied in my own case. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and in my yeah. case, I'm I'm gringa, but I mar I was married to a, a Puerto Rican. My kids are Puerto Rican American, you know. So I share with them my positionality right from the beginning too. Like, you know, you might be surprised that I'm not Latina myself, but these this is where I connect. This is what I studied in you know in my PhD program, um, and 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 I'm and I'm also frank with them. Like, there are other sections that are being taught by other Latinos. If you if that if it's really important for you to be represented in the classroom, I I highly recommend that you take class with them. I understand that they don't have a lot of uh, of Latino professors, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. And yeah. and there is another very interesting question that Valeria put there that, um, cuando tienes inmigrantes que no se sienten latinos aunque hablen español. Uh, o no se sienten interpelados por lo latino. A mí todas estas historias me fascinan, porque es que acabo de escribir un, un artículo sobre resistencias en la, en la clase dentro de Critical Language Awareness. Y sí, hay muchos withdrawals en las clases también. O sea, hay gente que no se siente, que siente que esta no es su historia, eh, que siente que esto no se siente parte de, de su latín, de, que la latinidad es importante para ellos. Y creo que es, una, es un aspecto de, de las... De, de los estudios hablantes de herencia que tienen, de los que tenemos que hablar más. ¿Sí? Porque creemos a veces que, eh, que, que esto eh, estamos hablando de su experiencia cuando realmente ellos sienten, eh, no, that's not me. Ok, so the resistances. I think that's a huge topic. <laughs> We have to touch on it. Um, es, o se sienten identificados con su país de origen, absolutamente, y hacen un withdrawal completely because they feel that it's over-centered into the Mexican-American experience. That's another yeah. type of resistance that we see in the class. I think it's an understudied topic that I'm trying to get into. So, so yeah, you'll I, see I can some send of... my, my paper if you want to listen to it. Yeah, me. and it's also one of the, it's, we do have a couple of readings on our on my syllabus that are about the terms, Latino, Hispanic, and we talk about, you know, there are people, and we, we, we go over that in class, right, from like, that's like the second class, after I did nombres, Nom name nombres. I did. I did. Uh, I did what, all the different uh, terminology and what do you feel comfortable with? And then we also talked about the fact that Latinos can also include Haitians. They can include Brazilians, right? The people who don't speak Spanish, right? So um, I've and I've actually had some Brazilian students in my classes. Yeah. I think we have time for, for one more question. And then um, I was able to, at least to, um, from the Mentimeter, open all of the links on the last Great. page on my phone, Great. but they're not on my computer, but I'll make sure we get them sent out so that we all have access to the materials. Um, um, Cause that's why we kept here. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I have a question about the materials. I, I can't do the Mentimeter, so we'll still have access to those links. She's going to make sure we do. I'll, think, I'll okay. make sure everybody has access to them. I'll make sure I'm, we get them sent out afterwards. I'm really interested in the information on the discussion of terms, you know, Latino and Hispanic, mm -hmm. and that would really help me out. Yeah, okay. there's a lot of really good, um, there are a lot of, <clears throat> I Google, I Google and I find things and I mm -hmm. find things, I, I really love um, things that are bilingual because I teach this course in English and in Spanish. And so mm -hmm. there's a lot of really good, um, like one of them I think was national Ge was from national geographic. The most recent one that I use on Latino mm -hmm. versus Hispanic nice. versus Chicano versus Boricua. Right. Um, it was from national geographic and it was in both English and in Spanish. Oh, great. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Well, thank you so much for, um, well, first, thank you to our speakers. Uh, I, really enjoyed it. I, um, although I was moderating, I was also taking lots of links. I guess Marcos sending an applause. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, and make sure you fill out the survey. That's the last link I sent in the chat. That's very helpful for us. And you can look forward to another webinar next semester. And then I will just go ahead and plug it, even though I don't know the dates yet, but, um, 
at the beginning of the summer, we would love to see you all at our, it's either a one or two day workshop that we give where we um, all hang out together and talk about heritage learners and share materials and how we get the students motivated. And um, it's a good time. So I hope to see you at the next webinar and then again at our summer workshop. And in the meantime, if you have any questions, um, feel free to email either me or Joseli um, at text.